Street Library. My name is Tequila Davis, and I'm the library manager here. It is so nice to see you all here on a Friday night to celebrate reading and the books that shape us. One question we always ask is, who here has a library card? Raise your hand. <laughs> if your hand didn't go up, I encourage you to come back during business hours with a proof of address, and we'll get you signed up. Since this branch opened in 1908, we have been proud to serve as a focal point for our community, learning and artistic production. The room you're sitting in is where we typically host after-school literacy and mentoring programs for our Harlem community. Tonight, we are honored to open this space up in partnership with the National Book Foundation and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs to bring you notes from the reading life. This is our kickoff event in a series of four conversations featuring neighborhood heroes such as Thelma Gordon and literary stars like Caitlin Greenidge, talking about the books they love the most. Hopefully you were able to pick up your copy of one of Thelma's favorite books, Paul A. Marshall's Brown Girl Brownstone, On Your Way In. We will be hosting a book discussion here at the Harry Belafonte Library on Wednesday, July 25th. The details are in your program. I hope you, that you will read or reread the book and join us to continue with the conversation here. It is now my pleasure to introduce Beth Harrison, Deputy Director of the National Book Foundation. Please give me a big round of applause for Beth and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see you here. We are delighted to be at the Harry Belafonte branch, hosting the very first event in this new series where we take the age-old question, what books are on your nightstand to a new level? We're so honored that Thelma Golden is here to kick off this series and that Caitlin Greenidge will facilitate the conversation. In just a few moments, I will properly introduce Caitlin, and she will introduce, in turn introduce Thelma. Uh, the two of them, just to give you a lay of the land for the evening, will speak for about um, 40 minutes. They'll have a conversation, and then we will have some time for Q&A from the audience. Um, if you have a burning question, that is fantastic. Hold it until the end, and then raise your hand, and we will bring around a mic to you so that everyone can hear. Um, we'll also have a little reception back there. We'll have some nice, very cold lemonade, so hang in there, and we'll um, uh, enjoy a few moments of conversation together. If you have a question that didn't get asked, you can do it there. Um, I wanted to mention also that one week from today, this brand new series will travel to the Jefferson Market Branch in Greenwich Village. We will feature Project Runway's Tim Gunn in discussion with author Min Jin Lee. On June 15th, we'll be at the Bronx Library Center to feature comedian Desis Nice. And on June 29th, we'll be in Richmond Town at the uh, branch on Staten Island. So I hope you'll join us, hop around the city with us this summer. So uh, quickly, I'd like to tell you just a few notes about the National Book Foundation and what we do. Our mission is to celebrate the best in American literature, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. One way that we do that is through the National Book Awards, which since 1950 have celebrated great books with honorees ranging from William Carlos Williams, Ralph Ellison, Rachel Carson, Adrienne Rich, Lydia Davis, John Edgar Wideman, and Jessamine Ward. Our work also includes a wide variety of educational programs, such as Book Rich Environments, which this summer will donate 422,000 free books to children living in public housing authorities nationwide, including 75,000 free books to kids in New York City. Our public programs bring authors to book festivals, college campuses, performance houses, and public libraries across the country. We're so delighted and grateful that the New York Public Library has partnered with us tonight um, I'd like to thank Faye Rosenfeld, Emily Krell, Alex Kelly, Raylan Grogan, and the whole team there for their um, partnership. I'd also like to thank a few of the National Book Foundation staff, Whitney Hu, Mark Lee, for their work on the series. And of course, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, they deserve a second shout out. Okay, so let's get to the program. I would like to introduce to you Caitlin Greenidge. 
Her debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, was one of the New York Times critics' top 10 books of 2016. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Vogue, and Glamour, and she's received fellowships from the Whiting Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. She's a contributing writer for the New York Times, and she will be a 2018 through 19 research fellow at the Radcliffe Institute. Please welcome Caitlin Greenidge. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna keep Thelma Golden's introduction very brief so that we can dive straight into the conversation. Um, so as most, I hope everybody in this room knows, I think everybody in this room knows, um, Thelma Golden is director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, the world's leading institution devoted to visual art by artists of African descent. Um, and we're gonna just dive straight into conversation, so let's get started. Okay. It's called Notes from the Reading Life. Exactly. So I made lots and lots of notes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening. Thank you. It is so great to be here down the street from the Studio Museum in Harlem <laughs> at the Harry Belafonte Library of the New York Public Library. I was so thrilled when I heard about the renaming of this branch to honor one of our yes. great, amazing Harlem heroes. And it was also super special to walk in and see that fantastic picture of Langston Hughes yes. and to walk into this Alvin Ailey community room just, you know, celebrating really our black cultural giants, which is the work of the Studio Museum. So Yeah, yeah. I know. It's very exciting. I have to say, um, I was very excited to read at this branch, as, uh, to be here with you at this branch as well. Um, Harry Belafonte was always on in our house <laughs> growing up, and my sisters and I used to have such a crush on him on his uh, the album cover, Pure Gold. Mm -hmm. We would, like, fight over who got to listen to it and kind of hold it. So I, I'm just really excited to be here with mm -hmm. you as well. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, so was there someone in your life who encouraged you to read at a young age? Um, yes, you know, and I want to say, well, first of all, I'm just thrilled to be here with Caitlin. Did you all read her novel? Oh. Can we, no, no, no. Can we talk about that first? <laughs> and say that it's also great to be here with such a fantastic artist. Oh. And um, so when taking on this incredible invitation, I really took the question to be what books made me a reader, which gets to the question of who made me a reader. And so my choices very much mark my sort of biography in a way, in terms of the way I came to reading. And the person who made me a reader was my father, mm -hmm. um, Arthur Golden who was born on 135th Street and 7th Avenue in 1926 who was educated in public schools in this neighborhood, went to what was then called Benjamin Franklin High School uh -huh. on 116th Street and First Avenue, now Manhattan Center for Science and something. Right. Ben Franklin. <laughs> ben Franklin. Mm -hmm. And who, after serving in the U.S. Army, um, came back in the Korean War, came back to this neighborhood after finishing um, his college education at Howard University, came back to Harlem and started his business. My father was an insurance broker and a mm -hmm. lawyer. And his office was on the corner of 125th Street and 7th Avenue, about four doors from where the Studio Museum is now. Mm -hmm. Our building, the Studio Museum building, which was built in 1914, was a bank. So that was the bank my father banked in wow. his business. So my father made me a reader. Um, he was a reader. He deeply, deeply, deeply loved literature but he also deeply loved information. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Queens. My parents left Harlem in 1963 when they married. My mother was from Bed-Stuy, but we're gonna get to that when we get to Paula Marshall. <laughs> okay. That's where that comes in. Um, and so that, for many of you New Yorkers, understand that a father born and raised in Harlem, a mother born and raised in Bed-Stuy, there was no compromise in that, mm -hmm. right? That's how we ended up in Queens. Everyone's <laughs> like, why'd you grow up in Queens? I was like, no, my mother was not living in Harlem. My father was not going to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Simple. And they were part of a great it's wave of migration. Long distance relationship. That's family. right. To Queens <laughs> yes, yeah. in the 60s. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so my father um, 
was someone who deeply loved books and he loved reading. Um, we had a room in our house that other people would have called a den mm -hmm. that my parents referred to as a library. My father because he loved books, my mother because she loved the pretension <laughs> of the idea that that room was not a room to watch TV in, there was no TV, but a room that was filled with books, right? Mm -hmm. That you sat in and you read. Mm -hmm. And I was a child that loved reading and they encouraged that um, very much. So I grew up around my father's library, many of those books I still have, mm -hmm. which included African American literature and history, um, the great classics of literature. Uh, my father also was deeply interested in sort of science, so we had a lot of books about that. Um, and he also was interested in contemporary fiction of the day. So I read, you know, all the bestsellers of the 70s I read as a child. Um, and he really is the one who encouraged um, what it meant to have a reading life. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so one of your books you mentioned, uh, The Brown Girl, Brown Stones. Mm -hmm. And um, so why was that book important to you growing up? Well, that book was important because my father was the one that I had a deep relationship with, with books. You know, the other thing is my father was 40 when I was born, right? Mm -hmm. And so in 1965, that made him a very old man <laughs> to be having his first child, right? You know, so he was an old parent. And as such, he really didn't understand children in a certain way, right? So there was no sense of what was appropriate. Mm -hmm. So my father basically let me read anything, mm -hmm. right? And my mother, I guess, wasn't paying attention to that. So it wasn't until later that she realized that, you know, my father didn't make distinctions about what was like too mature for me. Um, and so we had a relationship to books that was sort of very wide. There are really only two books my mother ever kind of gave to me. The first was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and the second was Brown Girl, Brownstone. She was really pushing the Brooklyn on you, right? Yes. Well, because, you know, and as you can see from my life now, mm -hmm. she thought she had a losing battle right. even when I was 10, right? <laughs> right? I was always a little bit more Harlem, and she was trying hard right. <laughs> yeah. to get me into Brooklyn. But Brown Girl, Brownstone, I read as an 11-year-old, mm -hmm. and, you know, was engaged by Selena and by this story. But it wasn't until I read it again as a 16-year-old, that it just completely opened up a whole level of understanding mm -hmm. for me of my mother, who was the child of immigrants from Barbados, who grew up in a brownstone in Brooklyn that we went to. My aunt, my, my mother and father are now deceased, but my mother's sister, Gloria, is still alive, living in that same house mm -hmm. that my grandfather, an immigrant from Barbados, bought in 1928. Mm -hmm. my, my, my aunt, my mother had five siblings. They all lived in that house. And my aunt Gloria, who will be 90 in July, still lives wow. in that house. Wow. Right? And so it wasn't until, you know, I grew up with all the codes of that culture, right? I, my ears were pierced when I was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. I had gold bangles from the time I was three or four years old. I understood what that house that we went to every Sunday meant to my mother's family, but not really. And it wasn't until I reread Brown Girl, Brownstone as a 16 year old that I understood everything about my mother. Mm -hmm. Like everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that for me was a gift because mm -hmm. in some ways, like so many people, you really only understand your parents in relation to the life they've had since they had you. Mm -hmm. So the woman that I knew as my mother was a housewife in a house in Queens who drove out to the Green Acres Mall, you know, and bought place settings at Fortune Offs mm -hmm. and had lots of like, you know, women's clubs and organizations she belonged to and went, you know, on weekends to dinner dances, like, you yeah. know, this is the woman I knew, right? And when I read Paula Marshall, all of a sudden I understood the woman who she was to become this, yeah. and it made me not only understand her journey, but it made me understand all the things that I thought were quirks about my mother. Yes, yeah. All of a sudden were actual facts, yeah. right, of yeah. her being. And that's why I loved that novel and why I read it and reread it. And it was really later in life, I asked her, you know, I said, why did you give me that? And I didn't say, oh, now I understand everything about you. I didn't want to get psychoanalytic because she wasn't deep into that. Right. But she said, because I wanted you to understand me. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, what you're describing is, I think, uh, the thing that hooks so many of us into books really mm -hmm. young is when you open a book yeah. and you realize 
someone else has lived this experience before. It can even be just a small part of your experience, you know? Exactly. Someone else has felt this thing before. Exactly. Um, and has found words for it. Not even, not just felt it, but has found words for it and put it down and described it so that I can understand it too. And it's a really magical thing that happens when, you're, when you read and when you read widely. Exactly. Um, you know, children are so narcissistic. <laughs> you know, like when we're yeah. kids, we think we are the first and only right. person who has ever mm -hmm. experienced anything. And um, yeah, you're just, just sort of describing yeah. the magic of, of yeah. reading for kids. And I think also for me, you know, with both my mother and my father, it wasn't, it was really through books that I understood how much both of them had lived through significant parts of our history. Yeah. You know, what I thought was a very singular experience, right? That my mother had five brothers and sisters, I had these grandparents, they lived in this brownstone in Brooklyn. I thought that was singular, mm -hmm. you know? And what I began to understand is how much they were part of a whole fundamental shift, yeah. right? Yeah. In, in the culture mm -hmm. uh, at that moment in history. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, um, I also read that book, uh, I think when I was probably about 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad's family is from Barbados. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mom always wanted us to be very, my mom is not from Barbados, but um, she's very jealous because she thinks it's much more interesting than where her family right. is from. Um, right. And so always wanted us to be really into that culture. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was that feeling of, oh my goodness, these things that I thought were just about my family are part of this big, big, much bigger story than myself. Exactly. Um, and then I get to decide how I'm gonna use that and enter that and what that's gonna mm -hmm. mean for me to be wider. Yeah. Um, uh, one of your other books that you that you mentioned for us was James Baldwin's Another Country, mm -hmm. um, which is a fabulous novel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also another one of these books that you read or that I read, and I am shocked how current it feels, mm -hmm. um, how much it feels like it could have been written yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering, uh, you know, the, uh, that book is wonderful. It's full of really sort of vibrant characters. And I'm wondering if you can talk about um, who's your favorite character from that book and, and why? Yeah, um, well, Ida is my favorite character in that book. Mm -hmm. And really, um, Another Country is a book that I read um, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, it came to me after Baldwin's essays. Um, my father gave me the essays. My father had first editions of all of them. Um, my father went to the same junior high school here in Harlem that James Baldwin went to, oh, and wow. County Cullen was their teacher. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Um, wow. And so, and that was something I always knew. My father said that, that sentence would go together right? all the time. And no he, pressure in your reading right. life. And <laughs> so he gave me Baldwin's essays, but that was the point of my mother always being like, I think these might be a little bit too mature. But, you know, to him, it was Baldwin's essay, that voice, right, of Baldwin mm -hmm. through the essays. Mm -hmm. That was significant and important. Um, I came to the novels on my own. Mm -hmm. um, maybe didn't even know that Baldwin was a novelist, right? The Baldwin my father gave me was not. I'm a novelist, but came to another country on my own. And the reason I liked Ida is at that, at that point in my teenage life, um, you know, there's so much about that novel that I did not get when I read it the first time. I mean, I probably say that about everything, but very specifically, um, what was fascinating to me then was the way in which it spoke about a kind of artistic life. Yes. And about um, a sort of black bohemia. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I would have articulated my own path at that point, but it was very clear to me that what it was describing was something that I was fascinated with and fascinated by. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get to really reread and get into that novel until I got to college. Um, I went to Smith College. I wanted to go to Barnard, but my father, being born and raised in Harlem, felt that college meant going away to a mm -hmm. place that, where there was grass and buildings, you know. And, <laughs> and that was, you know, the Harlemite, the city boy in him. Like, you know, and I very much just wanted to go from Queens. My whole aspiration was just to get to Manhattan, mm -hmm. right? I didn't, you know, I wasn't trying to go anywhere else. My father was like, no, college is away. And so I went to Smith. And went to Smith knowing that I wanted to be an art history major. I had the great privilege in high school of uh, interning at the Metropolitan Museum. So mm -hmm. I went to college knowing I wanted to work in museums. But in college, studied art history and African American studies and was deeply privileged. Probably the transformative experience of my life was while I was at Smith College, James Baldwin was teaching 
in the five college area where Smith, Mount Holyoke, oh, UMass, yes. mm -hmm. Amherst, and Hampshire were. And I took a seminar with him. Oh, wow. And it was mostly for writers. So everyone yeah. in the class was like you, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to write, you know, <laughs> the great American novel. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was just, you know, like an art history major. And I, um, but I got into the class. And I really got into the class because I totally, completely, played my Harlem card. Oh, right? really? Okay. Yeah, I said, my father went to, you know, I did the whole, yeah, you know, yeah. went to junior high, mm -hmm. County Cullen, I, you know, I could do the whole thing. And that fascinated him, mm -hmm. right? You know, he was fascinated by that because in a weird way, there was so much distance in his life from mm -hmm. that world, but I had so much intimacy yeah. with it because I had heard those stories, the places, the names of people. So it was in that class that, you know, of course, we all wanted Mr. Baldwin to talk about all of his work, and right. he talked about everyone else's work, right? <laughs> really gave us this history of literature through his eyes, which was you know, invaluable. Yeah. Um, but in that class, I told him how much I loved Another Country. Mm -hmm. And he said, who was your favorite character? And I said, Ida. And he laughed because that was so obvious, right? Mm -hmm. That I would say that. Um, and he signed you know, my copy of Another Country, which oh, I wow. still have. Um, wow. With the knowing, right, of what it meant for me, you mm -hmm. know, to have that direct connection between the character that he'd written mm -hmm. and my own sense yeah. of aspiration for myself. Wow. What was he like as a professor? In oh, class? he was not a professor at all, and that's what was great. <laughs> yeah. Literally. You know, I, so many people I hope, you know, I've seen, you know, I am not your Negro, mm -hmm. right? So you know that voice, right? Mm -hmm. the, like, Baldwin's voice. And so imagine, you know, for what was scheduled to be two and a half hours once a week, which really would go to four. Yeah. Right? And he'd start at the beginning and he just would keep going. And it would move between deep analysis mm -hmm. of works of literature and remembrances of his own life. Oh, wow. He would take questions, but he wasn't interested in our questions because he didn't think we knew anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we were young. No, and he was right. Right. He was right. Yeah, yeah. Right? We were young people, but often our questions would prompt him. Mm -hmm to talk about something else. Mm -hmm. I don't think he knew, certainly we didn't know, that was the end of his life. So I was in his class in 86, mm -hmm. 85 or 86. And he also was thinking back a lot. Right? Yeah. So there was a lot, and that's where we would talk about Harlem. Mm -hmm. Because there were things he would say or I would sort of put out there and he would answer in these memories of his life, you know, in this, in this neighborhood. Yeah. But he was an amazing professor. And yeah. he also, you know, I have to say, he had very close relationships with the visual artists of his day. Mm. And was one of the people I credit with my sense of responsibility towards, you know, being part of the writing of a history for black artists, black visual artists. Mm -hmm. Because he made me know how many of them had not been written into the history. Yeah. And, um, and spoke about that a lot. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Um, um, skip ahead. Uh, one of your books is also Toni Morrison's Sula. Mm -hmm. um, and when did you first uh, pick up that particular book? Sula was assigned to me by my um, junior year um, English teacher mm -hmm. um, at the New Lincoln School here in Manhattan. Um, and Jody Cohen, that was on her reading list, and um, reread it. Now I have to say, for some reason, I'm not sure why, I always try and figure this out, I had not yet read The Blue Asai. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that is, because that's just a rite of passage for every black woman everywhere, right? right yes. That you have to read The Blue Asai when you're a teenager. And somehow I missed that. So Sula was the first Toni Morrison novel that I read. I was obsessed. Mm -hmm. Truly obsessed. And um, read it at that moment, not understanding it, but being completely compelled by the language. You're right. Yeah. And it really set the standard for me of my relationship to literary language. Mm -hmm. Like, if it couldn't be that, I wasn't so interested. Oh. <laughs> I know, it's hard. It's hard. But it's the truth of it, yeah. right? I just, I, I found myself, and part of it, I think, is because of all the things we know about Toni Morrison. Her language is so visual, mm -hmm. right? And I already was in the visual, right? Mm -hmm. As a high school student, I spent my time in museums, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I began to think about. This is where I would like to spend my life. But the visual was how I entered into the world. And this incredibly rich visual language yeah. was incredible. The other thing about it was that, you know, I was raised, you know, by an amazing woman, but one who lived within a certain definition of what it meant to be a black woman mm -hmm. of her era, of her time. And Sula Peace <laughs> really opened up the idea that there was some 
radical redefinition mm -hmm. of one's sense of self yeah. outside of the confines of society that was possible. Yeah. Um, I, so I read in high school, then in college I was a double major, um, African American studies, so read it again mm -hmm. in college, assigned, and basically probably have read Sula every three or four years since. Oh, so it's something you come back to. Oh, constantly. Constantly. And here's the other thing. Um, you know, another voice. So, you know, James Baldwin's voice is one that's in my head and love hearing. Toni Morrison's. So I will say, for anyone who has not read Sula, read it. But the real gift is the Sula book on tape. Mm -hmm. Re Sula read by Toni Morrison. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. It's just an experience like no other. And I've, you know, listened to that about 4,000 times. I mean, it's just on in my house, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> right, right. Because I just think it just changes, you know, the, the you know, electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right? Her voice, her words. But, you know, I've reread it over and over again, and I think, you know, every time I read it, of course, it's layered with all the things that I know about the world. Mm -hmm. So my sense of it changes. Mm -hmm. But it also stays the same. Yeah. And that's what I love. Yeah. She, um... Uh, there's a great anthology that's out of print right now called Conversations with Black Women Writers. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, and her, if you can track it down, you should get it. And her, um, her interview is fantastic. And she talks all about how one of her ideas around language or her, dri her drive with the language that she uses is that she's reinventing uh, the language that we hear in parables. So she really goes mm -hmm. for the words that we hear over and over again, like love. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like sister, like all these words that we hear mm -hmm. over and over again and have, because they're overused, they've been stripped sort of all, exactly. of all meaning. Yeah. And can she put them on the page and in a sentence in a way where we get back to the original meaning of that word or mm -hmm. what that word means in the stories and the fables that have mm -hmm. sort of come up all around mm -hmm. those words, which is a huge task to give to yourself as a writer. When I read that as a writer, I'm like, oh wow, yeah, this is like, and a, like a, a whole other um, thing to sort of assign for yourself. But yeah, the, it's the, the, the language of that book um, that is happening from a word to word, sentence to sentence mm -hmm. level is just amazing, yeah. so yeah. She also, for me, is the example of what, of all the things that I think are important um, to understand about significant artists, mm -hmm. you know? And the first, and I'm paraphrasing, but she always said, you know, if the books are out there that you wanna read that haven't been written, you need to write them, right? And mm -hmm. I think that really, for me, is what has informed my path as a curator around working with the work of artists of African descent, yeah. right? Like, so many artists of African descent have made artworks to allow us into an idea of what we have not seen. Mm -hmm about ourselves, about each other, about our history. And I feel like she, for me, is such an example um, of a kind of pure and rigorous genius that's just incredibly inspiring. Yeah, for sure, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Um, one of the books on your list is also uh, Maya Angelou's The Collected Autobiographies. And I'm wondering what's the most important thing that you took away from uh, that particular uh, mm -hmm. book? Well, I, you know, now I did, of course, read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think, you know, when I think about um, sort of Sula, that moment is Sula, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and their eyes were watching God. That's all one year. That's mm -hmm. like my junior year in high school. Yeah. And so I read... And I really feel in some ways, at that moment, Sula kind of won, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That, that was the, the novel that kind of stayed with me and I felt like I had to continually revisit, mm -hmm. um, which was like a youthful mistake, right? Where we just kind of follow our taste and don't sort of widen it immediately. So it wasn't until I would say, um, my mother passed away, I was probably, at the time I was 45, mm -hmm. and very much trying to understand what it meant to live one's life at mid-age, right? You know, I thought there's so much in the world about, you know, what youth is about, and we have, you know, everyone ponders old age, but I was really curious about it, and very curious about it specifically mm -hmm. as it related to black women. Yeah. And, um, and so I realized in that moment, I heard an interview with Maya Angelou on NPR, 
And, you know, I don't know what book had come out at that point, but she was just talking. And it made me remember that I had read the other biographies, but not in order, mm -hmm. right? So they'd kind of come at different moments. And I set out on this task. It was sort of a different version of self-help. I mm -hmm. thought, okay, I'm going to go to Maya for my essential wisdom. Like, how am I going to live my life from 45 to, say, 85, if I'm that lucky? And it meant that I sort of started again, you know, with... I know why the cage bird sings, but quickly move through. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we move through her life. So the first thing about it was that it automatically makes you feel very insecure. Because mm -hmm. you realize that you get through the first three, and she's not even at midlife. Right, exactly. <laughs> and already, okay, we've been on multiple continents, <laughs> you know, multiple lives, careers, uh, you know, so that inspiring. But it also, for me at that time, reading them all together, and I did literally start to finish, was, you know, again, about this necessity in the space of a world that does not have very good images or models exactly. for you mm -hmm. that you have to make your own. Yeah. And that's really, right, yeah, what I thought. Of self, and I yeah. felt that, you know, I had an idea of her in the beginning of her life. Mm -hmm. And then I had an idea of her at the end of her life, right? These sort of Oprah years, I call it, yeah. right? But the middle is fascinating. The other reason I read it is because, you know, my experience of place is often informed by literature. Mm -hmm. So in this time, I've been at the Studio Museum now for 17 years, right, after a decade working at the Whitney. But coming to work in Harlem made me also go to literature mm -hmm. to really think about this neighborhood and understand it and understand how it's been understood by artists. Mm -hmm. Visual artists, of course, which is at my core, but through literature itself. So also what was interesting about that is the way in which Part of that midlife is here in New York, but also involved in Harlem. I was also interested in reading that at that time because of the fact that it really led me to the idea of um, memoir generally. Mm. And um, when I read it all in that way, um, it was before she passed away. And I remember talking to you know my friend and another fantastic, amazing artist, Elizabeth Alexander, mm -hmm. and I sort of said that I took, actually we were sitting right here in Vinataria, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, Lizzie, I just read Start to Finish all at once, mm -hmm. right? And we had this whole conversation you know, about the stories of black women, and that set me into a path of you know any number um, of memoirs, which are fantastic, mm. um, by black women, yeah. uh, you know, sort of past and present, which together form, I think, an essential curriculum for anyone. Yeah, right? yeah, I agree. Um, I Maya Angelou has one of my favorite um, writing routines that I've ever read. If you look up her Wikipedia page, it's written in full from mm -hmm. her, I think, her Paris Review mm -hmm. interview where she said that the way that she wrote is that she rented, she would rent a hotel room and she would go there with only two books, the Bible, and I forget what the other one was, and she would bring a bottle of slow gin and a, car, and a, a um, deck of cards, and she would write in the morning and then spend the afternoon um, throwing the cards into an empty hat. And then she would read the Bible at night and then she would get up and do the whole thing again. Wow. And that is how she wow. <laughs> got, got to got her place of, yeah. of doing her sort of, um, uh, the language that she's putting yeah. down. The reason why I love that story is because it's what you're speaking to, this sort of like invention of your artistic self mm -hmm. um, and the myths that we create around ourselves and the mm -hmm. stories that we create around ourselves and the freedom that comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, is another reason why I, I as well really enjoy reading memoirs, particularly by black women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get to invent ourselves in a world that doesn't often give us the space to do so, or tells us we don't have the space to do so, mm -hmm. um, and to see how people tell, tell themselves about themselves, explain themselves, mm -hmm. and also build the lives yeah. that they are building is, is just really wonderful, so yeah. Completely. Um, so uh, you are a mighty and well-known figure in the art world, mm -hmm. um, but art bits aside, these books you've selected, have they inspired the work that you do at the Studio Museum, mm -hmm. um, and have any others, and how does literature inspire you in your work there? Yeah, so um, I think that literature has been a way for me 
to find and create context around visual art, mm -hmm. right? So that at any given moment, you know, if I'm working with an individual artist or a thematic exhibition, I usually am looking for some literary corollary, just as a way to begin to understand different ways mm. to think about the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, it's not with any plan in mind, it's just naturally a part of my process. Now some of that might go back to my academic life, which is that as an art history and African American studies major at that time, in the late 80s, in the art history department, no one was teaching the work of black artists. Mm -hmm. And in the African American studies department, no one was teaching art, right? Mm -hmm. So these two things didn't naturally come together, right? Yeah. The space in which I knew I wanted my work to progress. So it's why perhaps I do go to literature first, but also nonfiction mm -hmm. sometimes as well, as a way to understand and think about artworks. I don't know if there's any, anything in particular, right, that's informed my work, but I would just say it is, again, my reading life that sort of works alongside mm, mm -hmm. how I curate. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah, they speak to each other. Um, if you had to give one book to a small child to read, what would it be and why? Oh, definitely every small child in my life, every, you know, godchild, you know, all of them have gotten, um, you know, any number, but usually I start with Whistle for Willie by mm -hmm. Ezra Jack Keats. Uh -huh. Now, I'm one of the many people who did not know he wasn't African American. Me neither, yes. <laughs> I, I had to Google image search many times to convince myself. I lived in that fantasy, and so again, at the time I became interested mm -hmm. in art and thinking about being, you know, a curator, focused on black artists, in my mind, like, I thought, oh, of course, mm -hmm. this is where this formative came from because I saw those books and he is a black artist. Well, mm -hmm. then when I became a curator, I remember the Jewish Museum did an exhibition of his work. Yeah. And my curatorial colleague there, you know, wrote a beautiful essay and I called and I said, okay, this is totally rocking my world. <laughs> And so you can tell I grew up before the internet, where I would have known that in one click, but I went through my whole life. Mm -hmm. Now, what really makes that even more interesting and profound is that, you know, I've come to know his story mm -hmm. and the politics of why he created so deeply these black characters, mm -hmm. right? A snowy Day, Whistle, you know, for Willie, you know, all of them, and how profoundly radical that was yeah. to create those images. It's why I had those books and why, you know, often um, for little ones, it's yeah. sort of something that I share yeah. cross-culturally. I just think they're yeah. beautiful and artistically. They're gorgeous books. Yeah, yeah they're also really beautiful. Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and then if you had to give one book to a teenage boy to read, what would it be and why? You know, I don't know if I would split this by gender. Okay, you so know, for honestly, a teenager. I think teenagers generally, you know, um, one of the, you know, again, how I became a reader. So I spent one year in boarding school. So when I grew eighth grade, I spent my ninth grade year in boarding school. And again, I was a city child, and so it did not work out for me, mm -hmm. right? Trees, the grass, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, not, and I realize now how terrible this was, because this all was so much about, you know, my parents' own sense of, you know, what was possible, and all I wanted to do was go to school on the subway. <laughs> really. Like, that to me felt like what would be and mm -hmm. could be, you know, my relationship to adulthood, right? Being able to take the subway, you know, from my house and go to high school. So, one year in boarding school didn't work out, and then I got to take the subway and go to high school. And um, the New Lincoln School where I went, which I'm also proud proud to say Adrian Piper also oh, went to school many yeah. years before. If anyone has not seen the Adrian Piper retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, please do. Mm -hmm. Please do. Amazing exhibition, pioneering artist. So went to New Lincoln, and the head of school at New Lincoln at that time, in the, late, in the early 80s, was Vern Oliver. And when I transferred, I was coming in, um, you know, kind of, not midway, I came in the beginning of the year, but everyone else in the class had been there the year before, ninth grade year. And, um, and Vern gave me um, a copy of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, you know, I think, I think of my life in these periods. So, you know, my father made me a reader. He invested me in a life of the mind. You know, my mother made me someone who knew I had to do things. You know, my mother was an organizer. She made things happen. But Vern, in giving me, um, Invisible Man, in many ways, it's what deeply rooted me 
right, in an idea of African American culture mm -hmm. through culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, any teenager, I would say they should read Invisible, Invisible Man. Man. Definitely, Invisible Man. yeah. You know, Ralph Ellison, also Harlemite. Yeah, Harlemite. Now, the book that I want someone to write, and, and then I would say to anyone, most people, I'm, I'm, I hope people have read Invisible Man. If you haven't, please do. But really, also, what is fascinating is Arnold Rump Rumpusad's biography of Ralph Ellison. Mm. Fascinating. And the book that needs to be written is the biography of Fanny Ellison, mm. Ralph's wife. You know, they lived here in Harlem on Riverside Drive, and the story of her relationship to him, his art, this community, amazing. Mm -hmm. Needs to be told. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. Um, what book do you wish you'd read when you began your career? If you could go back and read yeah, one. Yeah, so interesting. What book had I, again, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there are probably so many. Yeah, exactly. No, yes. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I feel like there are so many. Um, so I don't know if I have... That's a good question. Yeah. I wish someone would tell me. <laughs> no, really, I wish someone would tell me, you know? Make a reading list the, for Right, your, this is for what you should have read and you did not. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do wish that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we didn't actually mention Americana, which was the final book on your list. It was, and it was the one that, you know, brought us to the present. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, my life, of course, has been, you know, bound here in New York. I had, the, you know, that one moment I went away, came right back. Yeah. Um, you know, in so many ways, uh, you know, so much of my life has been also not just in this city, but in certain places in this city. Um, and so it, it surprises me, but it doesn't, um, that I married someone who is not only not from America, but does not live here. Mm -hmm. So my husband is Nigerian, lives in London. Mm -hmm. And it is, again, I'd always been, again, Going back even to James Baldwin's seminar, someone who invested us in thinking about 20th century African literature, mm -hmm. was something Baldwin gave us, that class. Um, but it is something that I continue to be invested in because my own relationship to understanding Africa has come through literature. Yeah. And that has expanded now that my life right, includes you know, my family-in-law that live in Nigeria and that I now live within a history of not just Africa as a past, right, the way we think about it in relation to African American culture, but very much um, my life both personally through my marriage to Duro, but also professionally mm -hmm. in the work that we do at the Studio Museum, being a museum of artists of African descent, of living within the world of African art, culture, and ideas today. Yeah. And so Chimamanda's work is very much at the center of what has been a wide circle of what I see now as this incredible, fertile moment mm -hmm. in contemporary African literature, particularly by women. Yeah. Yeah, which for I think sure. is fantastic, and yeah. all you know of those novels that have come out in the last ten years, I yeah. find, you know, incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, that book is just extraordinary. And I remember reading it um, and putting it down at certain times and just calling anybody that I knew to say, you have to read oh, this yeah. book. Oh, no, completely. You have to read this book. Um, and one of the things that I love about that book, too, is that it's a love story. Yes. Um, because so many novels published today are so sad. Right. <laughs> and um, right. and it's, it's a love story that is completely believable right. Um, right. And, and feels very much of our, our moment. Yes. And, and both of those characters are just so... You just want to follow both of them anywhere. That's right. Yeah. They're richly drawn. But, you know, also Half a Yellow Sun was also a love story. Yeah. But also, but I also felt about Americana Nut that I felt very profoundly seen. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. and I think that happens when outsiders look, yeah. right, at you and your culture. Yeah. Right? So seeing America through her eyes. Mm -hmm. I felt the same way about Zadie Smith's On Beauty. Mm -hmm. That shook me. So, you know, it's like... That also I felt very profoundly seen, yeah. right? Her view of American culture through that novel was, you know, incredible. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I think I, we just have time for maybe one more, or it's time for questions? Okay, two more questions, oh. all right. Um, so I will ask you, uh, so Harlem's community recently saved Langston Hughes' home, mm -hmm. and it's now a nonprofit called the I2 yeah. Arts Collective. Um, and what are your thoughts on this and Harlem's literary community 
and sort of the legacy of this, of that community in this place? You know, um, one of the great pleasures of, of you know, living partly in London, um, as Duro and I commute between London and New York, is the way in which um, history lives in the present, mm -hmm. right? So that you walk past buildings and there's, you know, a sign that tells you what might have happened there, yeah. right, in the past. So I think that the saving of Langston Hughes's house was an essential task. Yes. And I applaud the many efforts that made it happen. I wish it had not been so hard to do that, meaning I wish there were a mechanism that would have made it a natural act, mm -hmm. that we would be saving, preserving, conserving, continuing to grow mm -hmm. these uh, places where the culture lives. You know, it's one of the things that I think is fascinating about Harlem, because so much of our history is not necessarily in buildings or mm -hmm. places, right? It, it happened in the neighborhood. And so when you go on the amazing walking tours in Harlem, you're often looking at something that isn't what it was. Right. But it is where it happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that I do wish that in this community, while we continue to move towards our future, that we continue to also honor our past, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. understand that that past is really what this present is built on. Mm -hmm. right? So that, you know, I, I applaud, you know, what it means to think about always the need to move ahead. But I also know that, you know, this is a community with a deep and rich history, mm -hmm. right? That was lived here in, in real ways, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the setting for all of this great work, right? Yeah. All of these incredible artists. I mean, this has been the privilege, you know, of getting to know and getting to speak to, you know, Mr. Belafonte telling me, you know, what it was like in those days to have plays, you know, happening in what now is the downstairs space at the Schomburg. <laughs> right. And the way in which, you know, the Harlem Art Studio, that artists were making their work, but everyone could go in and see those artists working. Mm -hmm. And how much this neighborhood created the opportunity for artists mm -hmm. and for a creative life. But it was also lived among all the rest of the life of the neighborhood, yeah. right? In the restaurants and the bars. And, you know, that this was very much the way in which people understood Harlem. So I, I want to and I hope that we can continue to preserve yeah. um, in ways that people in the future will be able to touch and feel that past. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and then I'll just ask you finally, uh, is there anything that you're excited to read this summer? You know, I, here's the thing, you know, I don't like reading fiction in small bites, yeah. right? It's why I'm always behind, right? So you know how you go to like those parties and everybody is read, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, and I'm just always behind, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't like to do it like three pages at a time. So there's so much that I feel like I haven't read. So I don't have one thing, but I just, I value the summer for the moment. You know, I was the kid who got through like the summer reading list yes. in like the first two weeks <laughs> right. of the summer. You know, I valued that, like mm -hmm. the opportunity for that list and then, you know, would move through it. I also have to say, you know, I grew up in the public library because again, this is something I, I you know, really value that my parents, because, you know, on one level, as I said, you know, we had this, you know, my father was a book lover, a book buyer, um, deeply a uh, book buyer. We, you know, Books were all over the house. My father lent his books freely. But my parents also believed deeply in yeah. the public library. And I grew up in Queens, in the Queensboro Public Library. You know, the big mark of my maturity was being able to leave our local branch on Linden Boulevard, which I could walk to, <laughs> and being able to take the Q3A bus mm -hmm. to the main branch on 164th Street. And, you know, I remember, you know, those librarians who really encouraged what then was for, you know, f made possible by my parents, but my sense of, through books, moving out of the sort of narrow confines, yes. right, of, of, of the world as perhaps I could see it into this wider world, yeah. right, of books and art and literature and all of these things that were possible there yeah. for me. Yeah, wonderful. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, and there's a microphone going around right over there, and one over there. So if people want to raise their hands, and we'll come to you with the microphone and um, ask some questions. Uh, 
Hi, Thelma. Uh, my name is Bijan Mers, and uh, I, 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 sent, uh, I had sent you a message <laughs> before because I attended your previous talk at the Times. Thank you. Because I'm phenomenally inspired by you. Thank and you. And you're a pioneer um, in all sense of the words. And uh, besides thanking you, I wanted to actually present you with a gift. Oh my gosh, um, thank you. I'm a designer. Come up. <laughs> Say your name again so everyone can follow you on Instagram. That's how he sent me a message. <laughs> okay, turn around, tell everyone your name. Uh, my name is Bijan Mers. Um, and you're a designer. Say, I'm a de designer. Um, <laughs> But I really wanted to thank you thank for you. everything you, you do. Thank you. Can I have you? So sweet. I'll talk to you after. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions? Additional questions? I know. That's a tough follow-up. I think we have a question right here. Uh, hi, I'm Hoshonda Sanders. I'm a writer um, from New York, the Bronx, actually. So mm -hmm. I love what you had to say about your parents mm -hmm. uh, being from different boroughs mm -hmm. and their compromise. It's lovely. Um, thanks for your uh, uh, insights also about the reading life and the lives of black women in particular. Um, I wondered if uh, you could speak to um, uh, some of the unique challenges, I think, of, of black women artists um, and how your relationship with literature has helped you um, maybe navigate those um, and advise artists in navigating them. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think it goes to what made me go to Maya Angelou, right? And go to... Um, you know, her autobiographies because of the fact that I felt like there just aren't always examples. And it, to me, seems like when we look to the examples, you know, of these women through their work, in the way in which they have related their story, that's where we find examples. And the examples aren't literal. I don't know if we necessarily find an exact way to be, but what we see is the example of what it takes to do so. I think what, for me, you know, when I think about, you know, her autobiographies, but, you know, I also think about, you know, like Margot Jefferson's Negro Land, or, you know, recently Jessica Harris's My Soul Looks Back. Oh, that's or, a fantastic book. Oh, wait, totally fantastic. Um, you know, or Susan Fales Hill's Always Wear Joy, or Elizabeth Alexander's Light of the World. What we see is, you know, the way in which um, these women can tell their story in its triumphs and the trials, Right? And create a sense of understanding of what possibility is and can be. And so for me, I think that's really where the examples can come. Oh, I would also add to that. Nell Painter has a, a memoir that's coming out this summer that's called right. Old in Art School. I'm reading it right now. That I'm so excited for. I'm reading it right now yeah. in Galley. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Okay. 42nd, 42nd Street, now, exactly. What, what's the date? No, that, so June, June 27th, Nell Painter Sorry. at the New York New Public, Public Library, Library. Yeah. 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. Please come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, one more. The Beowulf, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. A question for you, for all that you've seen now in the visual arts and have enjoyed in the literary arts through your life's journey, have you seen in the visual soulmates of your heroes and heroines in the literal? Hmm, I'm not sure what you mean. Have I seen... Well, in other words, is there somebody, is there a visual artist who you've seen who is in, who you could see as being some type of uh, echo, if you will, someone whose, whose art visually speaks to the work of an artist who works with literature? as a medium. Oh, yes. I mean, certainly. Um, I don't know, though, if I've made those direct connections, but I know what you're saying. Like, have I, I seen equivalencies? 
Yeah, I'm not sure, but I think that's definitely, I mean, it actually sounds like an exhibition, so you're just giving me an exhibition idea. <laughs> Thank you, I'll give you credit. That definitely sounds like something to actually pursue, to think about how those actually could possibly go together. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So um, can I thank Caitlin and again, oh. read her novel, <laughs> buy her novel, read her novel, but thank you for your work. Oh. You know, because oh, in it, the astonishing, no, again, someone with language, but the imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And the ability to create a reality that then we follow that gives so much perspective, yeah. right? On our present yes. through that family and the way in which they traversed the world you created. Amazing. Oh, well, thank Amazing. you. Thank Amazing. Thank you so much. So thank you. It's a yeah. privilege to be here with you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank privilege. you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that made my whole week. No, no well, I have your book for you to sign. <laughs> yes, okay. I have it here, yes. so. Yeah. Um, I would just like to say before we end tonight, um, thank you to you for being here. This is just a dream come true, a real treat. Um, I want to remind everybody too, um, you should have gotten your copies of uh, Brown Girl, Brownstone. If you don't, we have um, additional copies up here. And uh, when is the um, reading group happening again? Okay, so July 25th, 5.30, this branch, um, there'll be a discussion group for the book. Um, and can I say one more thing? Because I have to say this as the director of a nonprofit cultural institution in this neighborhood. Please support our libraries and support our branch libraries. Now, let me say something. You know, we've been privileged at the Studio Museum to be working with the branch libraries. We had a fantastic project at the County Cullen branch last summer now one in the Schomburg, but all of these branches in Harlem are doing such amazing work. The staffs here are providing essential service to this neighborhood. These buildings have lived in this neighborhood for so many years, but continue generation after generation to provide knowledge and space and safe space. So please support our libraries. Support our libraries. <laughs>